at 6.30 p.m. if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Public comment. Go with the board first. Do we have any board comment? Any public comment? Is this Nathan? No. No. Okay. Appointments at 635. We have Whitnam and Bingham Associates to talk of 357 Electric Avenue. Hi, Jamie. Hello, everybody. For the record, my name is Jamie Rowe from Whitman and Bingham Associates, and my client is Mr. Joseph Russo, uh, property owner, owns a piece of property uh, on Electric Avenue here in town. Um, it's the former site of the Whalum Drive-In. And if it's okay, I'll just pass a couple plans around. In light of um, the planning board in the town of Lunenburg considering um, medical marijuana dispensary and you're updating your zoning regulations to allow this. Just walk in. Peter walked in. Yep. Okay. Just to let you know. Thank you. Um, considering that you, you're going to be talking about this in a few weeks and considering some bylaw changes, I'm not quite sure if they're going to be. Uh, by right uses listed in your zoning code or if they're going to be uh, zoning overlay districts. I'm not quite sure, but I'd like to bring to your attention a piece of property that we would like to consider to be part of this uh, new bylaw, uh, if possible, and that's the former site of the Whalum Drive-In. Sure. Yeah, it's about 15, 16 acres. Uh, everybody, if you remember the site, uh, it was clear-cut, paved, um, and it's a great location right off of Route 13. Um, it has municipal water, municipal sewer. If you remember a couple of years ago, um, I made a presentation before the town meeting uh, changing the boundary, the sewer district boundary, and including the majority of the site, and the town voted that in. So the entire site now can be sewered, which it couldn't be a couple of years ago. So um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to have a dialogue of this, about this or not, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention so that when you do have a conversation about it, maybe you can take a look at this site between now and then and maybe consider this as part of your zoning change. That's all. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Jamie? No, just kind of curiosity. I know the last time you came in before us, so I think you were... Uh, looking to put two or three buildings on there with three different uses correct and, and nothing correct. ever became of that it did it did in fact this would fit into those plans um okay. th there are three buildings right now we're doing some conceptual site design three buildings uh two buildings uh there's going to be a uh, commercial space in the front uh, also uh medical again there's going to be building hopefully it could be a medical marijuana dispensary in the back and uh, self-storage. Self -storage. Uh, so there's three uses. Uh, we can do that via an A&R plan. Uh, and all three uses can be sewered, watered, uh, and everything works out just fine. Okay. So that, that you're absolutely right. I think I brought that plan before you quite some yeah, time. Yeah, that was quite a while ago. Yep. So I was just curious yep. as to where that had gone. Yep. OK. Um, spaces are uh, filling up over there. So that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Mm. Economy's back a little bit. Yes. Thanks, Jimmy. OK, thank you, guys. Questions? All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, uh, oh, one Nathan question. does. Jamie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jamie. 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 One more. Nathan has one question. Sorry, Sorry. Hey. Uh, you know, thanks a lot for you know bringing this to our attention ahead of time. It's real helpful to understand what what people are, are interested in in doing. And I don't know, just speaking for myself, not the board. I mean, we we've discussed a number of options. You asked some questions earlier, and we have we have some plans that are underway for proposals to bring to public meetings and whatnot. But we're not. We haven't nailed everything down, but um, you know, I think it's in a lot of our discussions somewhere like you're talking about is could could be a pretty attractive place. And I guess question I don't think you have to answer this, but I'm curious: uh, is your is you and your client engaged with the state yet in the uh, 
licensing rigid process. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Yep. Well, thanks a lot. Yep. Any others? All right. Thank you, Jamie. That's not till 6.50. So we have some time. So I'm going to move over to number five because, um, oh, well, we can go, I'm sorry, to number four. Yep. Signing of 419 Sunny Hill Road. We have an A&R here to sign. They came in front of us two weeks ago. I'm going to open that up. It's probably easier not to see anything. Sure. And Marjorie did get... It was circulated to all the town departments. The Board of Health, it meets all requirements. The building inspector meets all requirements. Conservation. It looks like it's gonna need a notice of a tent for a 100 foot buffer, 30 foot buffer, but they have it on their agenda. Um, Board of Health, again, no issues. And the sewer. This area is in the sewer service. So it came back from all the boards fine. I'll make a motion that we approve the plan for 419 Sunny Hill Road. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Me. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I. So we can sign that as we're going. Next, we have minutes approval for 22414. I make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of February 24th, 2014. Thank you, Toby. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion on the minutes? I know you had sent. I think she was going to make some minor yeah. corrections. Which she did. Awesome. So we're all set on that? Yes, thank you. Karen. No, not at all. So all in favor of the minutes of 22414? Aye. 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 And aye. And those are getting passed down. And then we have the executive minutes. Okay, and I'll pass, we have to read those, those aren't emailed. So I sent that there for you to read. And Matthew, while that's going down and being circulated, could you talk about committee reports, MJTC? Uh, that's next week. It's a monthly meeting, so we okay. have not met since our last planning meeting. Okay, perfect. MRPC, I have no report. Our meeting is in two weeks. School building committee, Nathan? Uh, I don't have a report. We have a meeting tomorrow. Mm, okay. Building Reuse Committee, Damon oh, McQuaid. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll just join. Back to Nathan. Did you attend the workshop? I did. Okay, do you want to maybe talk about that? I'd be interested. Maybe the others will be too. Yeah, that was number seven. Oh, sorry. Okay, we got it there. That's yep. great. Sorry. Yeah, that is on the agenda for number seven, so we'll do it there. Cool. Damon, Building Reuse. So we had another meeting, uh, first one in a while, uh, last week. And we're reorganizing. Uh, it's basically an organizational meeting to talk about where we're going from here and uh, talking about how many members we're going to proceed with. So we're going to keep the nine members. We have one opening that we're looking for a citizen at large, I think, and um, someone with a real estate or construction background or law background to help out. And um, we'll be moving forward. All right. And actually, one more thing is. Um, it's going to be important for us once we're done with the medical marijuana thing to talk about how we're going to do the village district because the zoning of the 
center of town has a lot to do with the uses that would be possible for those buildings that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So they're going to put pressure on us to move forward with that as soon as we can. Okay. Sounds good. Yes. Uh, so I'm just, maybe so his. Uh, so this is great news. Thanks for the update, Damon. Things are moving forward. Is there any kind of like new? It sounds are there kind of some new kind of uh, assumptions about where things are going, like in terms of some of the different town assets as you're kind of going to this new phase? We are sticking with what we talked about in the past. We didn't have any further conversation on that at our last meeting, but uh, we will be talking about it more as we go forward. Okay, so it's still pretty fluid. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks a lot. Okay, capital planning. Marion's not here. Green task, Marion's not mm -hmm. here. And back to Matthew on Agricultural Commission. Yeah, same same thing there. They'll be meeting next week, it's a monthly. Okay. All right, the next we have planning director reports. The first one is the middle school, high school project regulatory review meeting. I did attend that um, for Marion on last Wednesday over at the TC Passios at 11 o'clock. Um, it was really their first meeting. So they talked about planning and um, they're gonna do a modified site plan review with us as a municipal building. They do not have to do a full-fledged site plan review. So um, I did give them the form. I brought the form for them and all the material. They would need to do that. So they are going to do that. Um, all departments were there. Um, they're gonna have individual meetings with the fire and the um, police because they have a lot of safety concerns and, and the fire concerns. The engineer, um, they spoke, the, electric, the electrical people. Um, so it was, a, it was a really good first meeting. Um, and they'll, they'll come in front of us, they're hoping, with, uh, in two to four weeks that they'll be looking to come in front of us. I explained to them that it's not a long process. It's not that they have to be on the agenda months before that we meet. Um, I explained what days we meet. So it was a good meeting. They're very organized over there. Mike Macklin and, and Loxie are, are very involved with them. So. Great. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for the update on that. Um, you, you gave us some information last meeting, Joanna, about the, you, you, would, you would ask counsel or, or Marjorie or someone for mm -hmm. some information about the, uh, the nature of the site plan review in this mm -hmm. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Do we have further definition around like what the... Well, that's what they're saying is that the, the mass, they don't have to do a full-fledged site plan review where it's a municipality, but to uh, have other eyes look at it okay. isn't a hindrance. Got it. that they recommended Mike recommended and they they agreed that they would do just a modified site plan that would still give us the plans that would go to the seven they would give their feedback like we've always done okay thanks yeah. a lot yeah no not at all you are welcome okay so that was that Highfield Village uh, was just a verbal update uh, Kent from Highfield Village should be dropping off the um, full large plan set by Thursday. The small plans have been distributed to departments, but we're looking for the three big to have a tech review meeting just as an informational where the fire chief, police chief are new, so that should be coming to the office Thursday. Force Corp at 305 Lemonster Shirley Road, there's no report. Subdivision 50 Elmwood Road, endorse approval. All right. Jamie, do you want to come up? Hello again. Uh, Jamie Rowe from Whitman and Bingham Associates. Um, we submitted a, a, an extension letter for tonight asking that this item on the agenda be passed over and granted a two-week extension to the 24th of March so that we can deal with the issues on, on that date. Okay, and I do have the letter of extension from uh, Jamie for the file. So we're just going to move that out till the 24th. Are you representing both parties? No, I'm representing the applicant. Okay, and that would be Mr. Mr. Crowley. Crowley. Yes. yes, at all times. Okay. And we do have an email from um, the property owner. The property owner asking the same thing. Mr. Ewing, Mark Ewing, had sent an email today asking if we could put it off till the 24th meeting. 
So we're, we're putting off uh, signing the findings and directives. Okay. We signed the Mylar last meeting okay. and just the finding and directives. They've asked that we put that off until the March 24th meeting. Okay. And they all parties agree. No problem. Is there, um, just want to make sure that they're, my name is Peter Campobasso. I represent Mr. Crowley. Um, I just want to make sure that there will, in fact, be a meeting on the 24th. Yes. Because I think we're getting close to the 135 days. Exactly. And I wouldn't want it to exactly. not give the board an opportunity. And that's what so. Jamie and I talked about today. Okay. Yes. Very good. Um, and the March 24th meeting is a public meeting. Um, they're all public. Right. But on TV. And you'll have an agenda that evening. Yes. In addition Same to as the tonight. public hearing. Yes. Okay. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you, Mr. Campobasso. Thank, Thank you, you, Jamie. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. All right. So that is all set. So we, we Joanna, if I yes. mean just about that. So we're just, we're not, we're getting close, but we're not in, in danger of constructive approval no. at this point. Okay. Excellent. Nope. Thanks. Just to that point, I'm, I believe where they've requested the waiver and we're granting it, it, it does stops it, it, that it, it does, it stops that and extends it for a period of time. That's okay. why we asked for it in writing. If the applicants ask for it. Yeah. So it kind of puts the, the, the overall process on hold for that period of time. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just, I actually have a question about the findings and directives. I don't know. If, uh, they look good overall. Uh, <laughs> I, is, is it always implied in the findings and directives that, so they, they, uh, that um, the project will be built according to the submitted drawings? So, f for example, like, you know, it said, uh, you know, like with the tree plan stuff, they made some modifications on the drawing, which was great, and we waived the tree plan, and it even said, you know, we'll be like, it's, it is on the tree. Is it, is it uh, just refresh my memory here, is we go, in general, when we approve a plan, if the project were to deviate from the plan, it would have to come. Yeah, they, well, a couple of things could happen. If it's a, a material change to the plan, it may cause their, uh, the need for there to be another public hear hearing. Okay. If it's something as minor as having doing a field change, yep. something that can be field and move, want to just move a lot line a little bit or what have you, uh, those things can be done in the field and those wouldn't require a public hearing or, or anything okay. like that. So, but for all intents and purposes, once we've signed the ANR, once we do the, uh, findings and directives, the expectation is it will get as planned and with all the findings and directives that are that have been outlaid. Gotcha. And, and that's, that's the building they, official's responsibility to ensure that the directives are met. And and that's why um, Stone Farm has come in front of us when they've gone from a three to a two yep. because the plan said a three and now they're going to a two. And Emerald had done that with the beach where they were gonna have yep. the house and they changed that. Okay, great. So for so okay, so the the so I get it about the the findings and directives, but also it's implied that the plan will largely be followed yes, as well. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Thanks a lot for clarifying. Okay, so now I'm just going to go back to the minutes of the executive session. We all read them. Just maybe for point of clarification. If there is a required to be a field change, it's typically done with the designing engineer and our reviewing, reviewing engineer having that dialogue oh. and conversation. Oh, and really? then our reviewing engineer and the designing engineer would provide us that information. They usually would send a letter. Right. So. Okay. Thanks. That's great. Okay. Back to the minutes of executive session. We just need to approve those if everybody was okay. Did everybody have a chance to read them? Yes. So um, I would make a motion to accept the executive minutes as submitted second all in favor aye 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 and aye thank you you want to go back to our 650 appointment is it 650 yes, yes i will at 6.50 A&R for Goldsmith, Priest, and Ringwall at 265 Pleasant Street. <coughs> Good evening, how are you? Good evening. For the record, my name is David Brauchuk. I'm the survey manager with Goldsmith, Preston, and Ringwall. Uh, here on behalf of 265 Pleasant Land, LLC. 
otherwise known as the solar field behind the Baptist Church. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, the attorney, I believe, was originally intended to drop off the stuff this morning. It didn't happen, so I have the Form A, the check, the abutters list, the original, and plans. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So. We will take those in. And what are we being asked to do here? He's going to walk us through that. Walk us through uh, Quick and simple little you know, A&R. Would you like it? Just put it right on Nathan where he's in the middle. Our parcel is the larger, 47 acres, mm -hmm. and we're cutting off a small parcel along the sideline and an even smaller parcel at the street line reducing our frontage by about 10 feet. We still have a surplus of about 600. Okay, and that line is coming in what direction? Both of these parcels are to be considered not building lots and for convenience to an abutter. Okay, so is it coming from? It's coming from here. Yep. And you're going right. here. So the line originally went where? Straight. Straight, Straight across. Straight okay, through. so you've come in this way. Yes. I guess my only question is, is the movement of this line relative to the solar panels does it have any impact on the step back requirement Absolutely not. Okay. The solar panels are further back okay just want to make sure that we don't break anything Create in the process the bigger issue okay understand. all right then i'm good that will be the registered okay Okay, so do we have any other board comment on that? Any questions? No, well, that looks relatively straightforward. And do this to say it's going to go through the process as usual. That goes inside it. I think they wrap that so it all stays together. Yeah, I'm just, if I, if, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask, but I'm in, you know, if it's not, don't, don't answer. <laughs> but I'm kind of curious, you know, given that, you know, there's only so much I can see from the 2D map as it is. Is, is there anything interesting kind of driving these small conveyances? Yes, yes. but it, it'd be better if you agreed to endorse vote one way or another, then I'd be more at liberty to discuss okay. it. Gotcha. It's, it's not relative to the approval process, but I can divulge that and such. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, then that's fine. Thank you. Do you want to ask? I have. Well, if I, if I can draw anything from just looking at the plan, it seemed like there was a driveway encroachment. Right, that's what I thought it was, was a driveway. From the that's exactly the case. There's the, okay. there's the driveway that, that crept across the line. So. His driveway. Yeah. Okay. So they're making it whole. They're making everybody whole. Yeah. We're cleaning up an encumbrance, encumbrance. if you will. Yeah. So they're making it nice. So. Yes. yes. All right, so what will happen is we'll take this. Is there any public comment? Okay. Yeah, we'll take this under advisement. Yep. It'll go to all the, the town boards, two weeks. They usually have all their uh, literature back. Again, it's straightforward. It's just cleaning up. So his driveway is on his I'm land. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good night. Um, yeah, you. and then we'll sign. You, you probably don't even have to come unless we have questions. Okay. And um, Marjorie would tell you that. Yeah. If, if any of the other departments, if it's conservation or anything like that, that's an issue she would let you know that. Otherwise, if they all come back, fine, we sign it, and you're good to go. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. And nice to see you again. <laughs> we missed you. We missed you. We missed you. We're going forward this time. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. White Woods, we're on page two. I don't know if you guys are on page two. I'm on page two. White Woods, no report. Emerald Place, no report. 651 Chase Road update of site work and that was scanned to you of just the solar field yeah, you know, exactly. they're following their weekly schedule pleasant installing racking for modules module delivery start this week chase road site work around perimeter of solar field underground trenching and conduit going small site racking is being installed 
Large site racking posts are being installed. Module deliveries start this week. So those are the two updates on the solar fields. And I was, um, if EPG, I, I was telling Toby, they started their solar field now in Shirley, the town of Shirley. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Shirley exit where the Sh uh, airport diner is and the old Shirley airport. It's right over there. It's, it's something to see. And that's going there if you ever want to take a ride over and look at that. Okay. All right, so now we're into the draft RMD to continue the work on the marijuana bylaw. So Marjorie typed up our current drafts that we made from the last meeting and sent that back out. She did book our public hearing and sent notice out for that for March 24th. So we all saw that, so that's all set to go. Good evening, Paula. And now we're just looking to what else we wanna add before we have it scheduled to go to town council tomorrow. Does everybody have there? Is everybody ready? Anybody have thoughts, questions? We, I don't think I got that one, Joanna. I was late. An extra copy, please. I don't. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Is this, oh, this is not the edit. Is this the edited one? No, this is. Oh, I do online. Okay. Well, I have a, I have a copy. We can. Look. Yeah. No, we got enough. Uh, I think you want this one with the. With the white highlights. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Okay. Did you have one, oh, one I more? guess that was the email. Oh, you go. I'll show you. Okay. No, I got one. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'm good. No, no, but do you have the annotated thing? Beautiful. Oh, we all have our own. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Okay. And then you sent an email. Yes, and I have yep. one minor thing since that time that, well, it's not minor, it's something to discuss as well. It's not, anyways. Okay. Well, go ahead, dove, dove right in. Um, let me just catch up real quick here. Uh, she added the buffer strips with all the setbacks that we had from um, solar. Remember we asked her to do that and then we could look at those numbers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got to catch up with all this stuff because she made some nice edits and she's got this stuff from Joel here. I'm not up to speed on. So we'll just start. Um, is everybody all set with the first page? Because really, for me, I wanted to go into the um, setbacks and buffer strips. But let's just see if we're all set with the first 
Well, I'm all set, but there were all three Nathan's questions. Uh... Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm all set with page one there for now. Okay. So 200 feet in the residential conservation recreation shall be 50 feet in commercial and industrial districts unless it abuts a residential conservation or restriction district, in which case the buffer strip shall be 200 feet in depth along such abutting lot lines unless the applicant can demonstrate in the planning board finds that adequate buffering can be provided in a narrower buffer strip. Setbacks in all districts, front yard, side yard, rear yard. So those were the numbers that we usually work with. Yeah, with the with the addition of the, I think there, so. The reason it's called out special is because we got the special provision about the 200 feet mm -hmm. on the residential. Okay, yes. that's great. Yes. And does that work for everybody? Is is 200 sufficient? Are you okay with that? Um, yeah, but I I still don't I still haven't found a conservation district in the town. Do we have a conservation district? I don't believe we do. I don't know if it, so much district as. But it's written there. So. Yeah, well, it's res, uh, recreation district, yeah. So was there a specific district that that was supposed to be applying to, or is it just in there erroneously on its own? What, what's this? What, what do you? Um, the buffer strip, second sentence, where it says residential conservation. I, I'm assuming. Well, it's one, two, two spots, and then it continues down. One, two, three. Conservation, conservation. 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 Hello. Yeah, so there's there's five instances in 14.64.6. Right, she's just calling them districts, residential district. I, I don't think she's saying there's a conservation district. Well, I think she's just referring to. Okay, but what are we going to suggest that's done about it? I'm sorry? Are we going to suggest that we do anything about it, or are we just going to leave it in there and have it printed the way? I mean, there is no conservation district in the town of Lundberg. Unless she's inferring the conservation land. Right, which is what I, I think it's, but we can have her check on that, yes. Well, this is, this is our directive, right? So what do, we, what do we think that that should be? Let's have her run it by Joel when he reviews it and just call it to his attention and see if he thinks we should insert the word, you know, land or something there. Because if, if we don't have a formal district called that, that seems like a good thing to check with legal. Right, and I think she's just signifying, for example, if you go down 50 feet in a commercial or industrial district, I, I think she's just referring to units as districts. That I, I'm not, I don't think she's saying they're specific, but we can have that checked. Yeah, absolutely, and it might be fine the way it is, and if not, absolutely. you can just tweak it. Now, is there anything in here for, about screening? Um, the design standards 4.16.7 contain guidelines around sc screening. screening. The state guideline, the state guidelines actually have some things that sort of conflict with the local guidelines around screening. So in the process, any kind of siting of this project would have to navigate, you know, the intent of the state and the design, 
and the design standard bylaws. Kind of similar to like in this uh, this project we just had come before us, the one uh, Force Corp, mm-hmm. where our design bylaw specified, you know, if possible, you know, have these bushes in front of the building or whatever. Right. And we said, well, that's going to have a cause a traffic problem. We're going to waive that. In this case, yeah, we're going to have issues where the state has specifically said we don't want screening in the parking lot for safety reasons in certain situations. So there might be certain types of screening where we might waive the design bylaw standard because of the more important goal of the state standard. This is our design bylaw, right? This is this should be no, a reference. This to is referencing this is a design. reference to the design standards. Okay. Okay. So does the the back to the two hundred five and fifty? Do those numbers work? Is everybody amendable agreeable to those numbers? I'm assuming the fifty just to. Just a sanity check. Is that the standard commercial yes. setback? That's fine. I mean, I think when we review commercial stuff, we might want to shrink that, but yeah. I think we, for now we want to leave it the same. So, cool. Okay. Everyone else? Did we decide not to uh, include the residential uses separate from the district? Like, if there's a residence in the middle of a commercial district, do we want to have a 20, do we want to have a 200 foot or a 50 foot? It's in the commercial district, it's 50 feet. A residential property exists in the commercial district. The commercial district setback requirement would be the only one that needs to be met. So that's what we're comfortable with? Okay. Yeah. Just bringing it out there. Yeah, but it's a good point. I mean, the, if it goes through like this with special permit process, you know, we c- will have the ability to address extenuating circumstances but if you've got it in black and white as 50 feet you can't make it larger uh in special permit process we probably could if we had ample justification or we could do something special with screening there and have ex- in- enhanced screening requirements so that's that's assuming this bylaw makes it through the, the you know the the whole process with the town and special permit remains intact okay well, if, if I'm reading this correct, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it, the side yard, each side yard setback shall be at least 50 feet, however, provided, however, that when the lot is in a residential outlying or recreation district or abuts a residential conservation or recreation district, the side yard setback shall not be less than 200. His point was a residential home that resides in a commercial district. Oh. Not one that abuts. Not one that abuts. I apologize. It's one that resides within the commercial district. Okay. And if you start doing that, you would probably, for all intents and purposes, eliminate lots that exist in the commercial dis- district from being viable. Okay. Yeah. And that person that owns that residential dr- dwelling may have that lot. Yeah. Now, the other thing to think about with the 200 foot buffer is 200 feet is one one side of a square acre so if you've got 200 foot setback from the front 200 foot setback from each side and 200 foot setback that 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 limits these to something greater than four acre lot yeah that would be yeah we ran into that because this is actually the same setback we did with the solar Solar. project (laughs) but um well the solar is in this case it's kind of unlike it's relatively unlikely that you're going to be at a corner you know like it um, the worst you'd probably get would be like half of the square acre um it'd be unlikely that like i don't know toby maybe you you have uh the uh our zoning bylaw book with you i have it right here because i thought one of the things that we were specific about with the zola bylaw was the the acreage the lot size i don't know that's a good question maybe we were thought we were we might have been i have to refresh my memory if we weren't specific about the acreage, the 200-foot setback certainly um, created an implicit. <laughs> because what, what, we atte- what we were attempting to do with the zo- solar bylaw 
was to get it, if it was going to be uh, in a residential district, to get it so that there was enough screening around it so that it would be more centralized to the center of the lot. That yep. was the intent, so it wouldn't be visible from the street. So I believe that I thought we had put something in there that uh, relative to the overall lot size. So. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the thing, the, the issue that, that Matt raises, it's kind of interesting to think about in this respect. Like, just hypothetically, if you run this against some data for lots, commercial lots we have, I guess the one thing that gives me a little pause about it is our commercial districts tend to be narrow strips off of main roads. <laughs> Exactly. Whose backsides are going to abut residential. And so unless those lots are pretty deep. Um, so when we were looking at doing the solar bylaw and we were talking about large scale ground mounted facilities, those installations may be located on any lot containing more than 20 acres. Yep. So by being more than 20 acres, the 200 foot setbacks from each was it the adequate thing? Yes. And let me see if we did a similar piece. And I think the small scale was more intended for the resident, regular residential piece, so there wasn't that requirement. I think we just went 20, 25 feet or, yeah. Yeah, it couldn't be closer than 25 feet. So for a large scale property, we made it 200. So I don't know if there's some level of consideration we would need to take for a grow facility. In terms of overall? The overall setback requirement of 200 feet. Because we, in this particular bylaw, in this instance, there's no specificity as to the, to the size of the lot, right? Yeah, well, we would probably not be, you know, if, if we rendered the site, if we rendered the use untenable, we would probably be forced to waive the requirement for cultivation in, on, a, on, a bar, on a qualifying farm? I'm not familiar enough with what the state law says to uh, what, the, what the size of a grow field can be, a commercial field, so I don't know if any of you recall what the state has. I, I can't did, they, did they set any limitation on the size of a grow field? I don't know about the field in terms of acreage I think they did probably set some caps on overall I think production you ought, we ought to take that as an action item to see what what it is if there's a limitation on the size of a grow field well, I think as Joe Joel indicated council um, I think he indicated that um, the state's outlook on this is that they can combine that they don't separate the two cultivation and distribution the RMD is the overall that and it because the questions we brought up to him about regulating them separately was uh, news to him. What yeah, was I don't, yeah, I, uh, do you yeah. recall what it was that triggered him to realize, oh, that's, that, that's a different question than I've heard? Because that, that was... That, that was, was the first question. Yeah. Yeah, and he, I don't think that's... I, I hear what you're saying, and, and actually Joel answered that one here, and he said it, his answer was basically that what we wanted to do was, a, was okay. Um, but um, but I don't know I don't think that had a direct bearing on Toby's question, which was, you know, what's the maximum? Is there, you know, what's are there regulations of the amount of cult land for cultivation? I think we'd have to look that up. Yeah, I think we need to look that up and get that answer. Because if the state allows a grow field, limits its size, and says then it can't be greater than some land use and it's only limited to five acres then it may be untenable to have a 200 foot setback in a in a residential area so i think we need clarity on that on that point 
Yeah, I mean, what do you think? I don't have a yardstick with me, but what do you, th I mean, like, let's say Chase Road. I mean, a lot of Chase Road. The com yeah, but let's also remember, part, part of the issue with the solar field was the aesthetic uh, siting of the solar field. Sure. I don't know that you have that same uh, uh, question to be, to be uh, vetted here because looking at uh, marijuana plants is substantially different than looking at solar plant panels, so I don't know. You know. Yeah, so in, in that regard, um, maybe we should, I guess where I'm going with this is, I, 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 you know, I appreciate the intent of what we were thinking when we put this in, but I'm not, I think we may just want to, at least for the retail and possibly for the cultivation as well, not at least for the retail, I don't know that we want to change the setbacks from what the underlying district are, because I think they could render, a, like similar with a residential unit, you think, render a lot of potential sites not viable. Yeah. Well, I think from a retail perspective, we were limiting it to the commercial district, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the grow facility could be anywhere, so. Yeah, so maybe we should condition this for the grow. So, yeah, that's. And that's maybe. Oh, sorry. That, yeah, I think that's the point. Is we need to understand that a little bit clearer. But and, yeah, I think the intent's right. So I think the intent is right. And maybe if if two hundred's not viable, so if two hundred's viable, we ask for two hundred. Otherwise, you know, try to make it as central to the property and unobtrusive as possible, or something. Some language like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, again. Okay. But um, definitely, can we make a record that we don't want this to apply to the retail part of it? The setback, don't apply setbacks to retail, research the limitations, on any research what the law has to say about limitations on production and consider, consider amending it. So after, consider amending it so that it just applies to grow usage and there it talks about, actually, I would say limit even to grow on farm because do we care about growing industrial? So just it just be grow in residential, and then if if the 200 set foot setback is prohibitive, then just ask that it be you know, you know whatever. What are those numbers to make it prohibitive? What what are those numbers to make it prohibitive? Right, based on what what the smallest one would be, what would that number be? If it's five if it's five acres, what would that Set that fee. Yeah, so it's, it's going to depend on the lot shape and a right. bunch of things, right? Yeah. So, so in those events, you know, to do something reasonable that achieves the goals mm -hmm. of minimizing impact on the neighborhood or whatever. Okay. So that's all set. So we're down to design standards. We added that. Yeah. Well, she. Yeah, Marjorie had, had had sort of a a repeat of it. And now she's edited it to just make a reference to it, which actually is what I requested, and I'm I'm really happy with it. Okay. Security, um, and I'm for security. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Damien. Um, I'm still not that big on the armed security guard, and I'm not even sure if Bill's going to say that's legal to, for us to say that someone needs to have staff but um and i thought we were talking about in the distance in the 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 situations where it was over on like if the industrial over on lemonster shirley road where that was so far away from the police station i didn't realize we were doing all so thought, even to me even there it seems no, more I, than our but i'm just that it was nathan yeah. and i thought my but, interpretation was the far out ones and what i was getting at this kind of wraps up an armed an armed security plan shall be required for all RMD locations and approved by both Lunenburg fire and police chiefs and submitted to the planning board. I want to make sure if we don't include the armed security guard part, I still want to have their security system and fire protection system reviewed by police and fire chiefs respectively. Absolutely. Yeah, I think she has that in there too. Um, I hope. Let's see. It sounded like they're lumped together when I read through it. That's another one of those kind of areas where I think we need to be clean and green what we mean by an armed security plan. Now, what is that? What is that? How do we define it? 
Yeah, so, so to me, I mean the security system. Because when the chief came in and talked to us, he brought the point where they know better than the person setting up the cameras what angles you should have. Because you can have all the cameras in the world, but if they're wrong place, yeah. they're not going to help you catch the criminal. Right. And the, and the CMR, um, I, I happen to look at the security page again today, and they have three pages of that they have to be able to see every view. It has to be going 24 hours a day. It has to record. There has to be a DVD of, uh, of every day on file. There has to be you, be, you have to be able to be able to take a picture within minutes of anything that happened. So the state itself has two pages of what the security system has to be able to do. I would still like to have the, the chief have the yeah, final and, review of it. Though. And that would be the add-on, is that all security is to be worked and approved by the fire and police, police chiefs chief. in the town. Yeah, and we can get that in this section. I thought it was in here already, but we should definitely, I think, as, as uh, Damon and Toby were saying, bust that out separately. Mm -hmm. um, about the armed, you know, you, you asked, you know, how did we get to that? And you were right. Originally, we had talked about, you know, originally we talked about only doing it in districts that we felt were in close proximity to the public safety building. Um, at our last meeting, Toby, was that too, and we, we discussed it some more, and there was two things. There was one, a desire to allow it to be in more places, mm -hmm. and also a recognition of the fact that given, even, given the limited nature of our resources for our you know, police, and I believe the specific number cited was two patrol cars out at a given time, that given that those cars could be anywhere, that uh, even just being near to the public safety building wasn't in and of itself necessarily a huge guarantee of protection. Right. And that's where, that's, I think that's how we ended up, that's how we ended up making it just about anywhere. Now I guess, you know, just one thing, is I was thinking about this was over the weekend a bit, and um, I hear what Damon's saying about, you know, you know, I, I, we'll have to find out if we're authorized. Right now, I think you know, or to do if we if we're even empowered to put that kind of requirement in there. And I, if we are, and we wanted to, one thing I'd like to look into is: do we have to put something in there about it being a requirement for the continued operation, or is this language good enough? Like you know. But the other thing I'm think I've thought about is that um, you know the the whole point of that provision is we've discussed it in our conversations has been to avoid problems that may arise from this kind of special nature of this facility right now in its context in the overall legal framework. I mean, basically, the biggest problem being it's potentially a cash business with a huge amount of cash mm -hmm. and almost guarantee that any customer pulling in that lot has a lot of cash on them. And that as, as has been seen in California, you know, could be could create some problems that aren't typical, even for banks where you know, maybe only 10% of the customers coming in have significant cash on them or whatnot. I, you know, I think this is a pretty serious thing. I don't, you know, I think we got to go through public hearing, hear what people think, you know, really vet this with the police chief to understand whether he feels an armed guard is going to increase or decrease public safety. But if we were to go forward with it, I think it would be good to condition it and only make it required given the changing things that are changing, you know, like the, the directive that the administration recently filed that says, oh, they, banks won't be punished for doing businesses. Joel said that's gonna take a while to kick in, but if a business is somehow, maybe Massachusetts state law made a provision, maybe the town set up some provision, if they were able to operate, if they were able to process credit cards and accept checks, I wouldn't see any need for this to be in place, so I would like to make it conditional on only, they only would need this if they could not process credit cards and checks, basically. Um, you know, that's, anyways, that's, sorry, babbled on about that, but that's. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that everyone listening and understands that our concerns with security aren't so much based on the fact that it's marijuana, it's based on the fact that it's the cash business, like you were saying. All right, there's, and everybody's there's, that uh, they're going to walk in buying two to five thousand dollars worth of yeah. marijuana because they're getting their month's supply and it's all cash. You have elderly and, and, and ill people elderly, in there doing this. That yeah. are walking in to get this. So as as the data shows in California, people are getting robbed. And as we in our last meeting, this came up, the the mobile station on Lemonster Shirley Road had been held up for two hundred and fifty dollars. 
and this is totally a cash business cash on hand and that's totally why this was made we all under yes yeah exactly that's a great point point. and if we can take the, if somehow the business or somehow is able to take that issue off the table we would be more than happy to take the requirement and at off last the table. time we met the bank still weren't taking the cash because it was illegal and the federal banks could not take illegal money yep so and, and the state just fixed that that issue just was resolved so as these grow these these things are going to so yeah over time right and then we won't have to if we had that condition in there we wouldn't have to amend the bylaw they just notify us hey we're able to take credit cards and checks now and that the requirement gets struck we don't have to update the bylaw if you know the situation moves forward more quickly yeah no i i totally understood the reason You know, yeah, so um, obviously we can should discuss anything else. Anyone has questions on? Would it make sense to to for you to, for one of us to read this whole thing to the public here? Because I think uh, Marjorie's done a really good job putting this together. I think as a board, you know, it's obviously it took us some time because it's a really complex issue and we had a lot of information to get. But I think what we have here is a pretty a fairly elegant, um, concise document and. Well, people we'll do it it, next week at the public hearing. At the public hearing. I was going to say, okay, if we want to give them a preview. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can, uh, I would suggest that we post the draft online as well on our page, <coughs> on our planning page. Yeah, we can do that as long as it's yeah, draft. That yeah, would be great. As long as we have draft going through it, absolutely. And I did, I had a meeting with Kerry today, and we talked about that. And once um, we get our final thing, we're going to have it on the town website. We're going to have it on the planning website. So when we have the public hearing, we'll be able to refer everybody to that because we were talking about the public hearing and it's going to be a little difficult because most of the bylaw is the CMR. Well, I'm not going to sit and read 58 pages of the CMR at, at that public hearing. So a lot of the, the public comment questions might be covered in uh, the, the CMR, CMR sure. you know, on top of this three page document. So that's where um, I'm still trying to figure out how we can accomplish all of that so the public understands that that's the biggest part of our bylaw is the CMR. That's a great point. I mean, if we could post like in one of those folders in that public thing, mm -hmm. a lot of the documents, including the CMR, including some of the presentations and sample bylaws mm -hmm. for people to get access to if they're interested. Yeah. That well, and that's what we were going to see if we could make you know copies of the whole packet once approved and have them at the planning office, have them at town hall. So if people want to come Pick and up. read, yep. they're there, they're accessible to be able to read them before the public meeting and, and then have the questions based off of that. Yeah. That's that's yeah. great. Yeah, I think if you were going to post this, we ought to also be posting the CMR. Uh, with it. Mm -hmm. And if there's also an FAQ that the state has yeah. that answers some specific questions that would typically come up from a community, that should be posted as well. Because I'm sure there are some standard questions that people will be concerned about. You know, the location relative to you know churches, schools, and those types of things. Absolutely. So. Yes. And could I, I? I've been thinking about this a lot this week. Uh, the, uh, the, the it, you know, we're getting some really good coverage of our discussions, and the the ledgers doing, it, and they had a, a good headline that really uh, I think helped call attention to the issue. But I want to make sure that people kind of I think the board of selectmen are talking about these issues as well. I just want people to really understand our perspective, as Damon was trying to do around around this this emphasis on safety and it really it really being all about the safety as Damon said of the people who are using the the RMD facility to get the medicine that they need and the the safety of people driving around the town of Lunenburg and the safety of other neighboring people in the commercial district and you know any abutters generally um, if people have feelings if they if they feel like you know this is you know, one way or the other, whether they think it's an overreaction to that we're going too far on the public safety issue, or on the other hand, if they support this and feel this is an important issue, I, you know, I would encourage them very strongly to, to attend the public hearing and get their voice in because this will be something that it, it's, we got a public hearing coming up. We have the Board of Selectmen, and we want to ensure that we're going to shape our final, and then there's town meeting, and the final decision will be shaped by the people who participate in those events that will determine which way it goes and we want it to go in a way that's uh most reflective of the goals of the people in the town of lunenburg 
the last thing, and this is me personally speaking, because we haven't discussed this as a board, regarding, you know, this potentially a, a significant provision like, you know, if we did, if it turned out that we talked with the public and the, the public safety officers like the police chief, and we did feel it was a good decision to move forward with something as serious as requiring armed guards, people, some, one perspective might be, well, that's an imposition on business owners. It's going to make it not attractive as a business. And I've been thinking about that the last few weeks as well. I guess what I would say about that is I think one thing we have to keep in mind is although people can make money operating these, and that's, that's fine, these, Massachusetts set these up as nonprofit institutions with the primary goal to, to provide a valuable medical service to the public. The primary goal was not to you know, money making. They're set up specifically, they can only be a nonprofit institution. And furthermore, the state of Massachusetts has put in place for legitimate, you know, um, well-intended reasons, anti-competitive regulation, which, which makes it much easier to make money in these facilities. So although, yes, if we did require armed guards, that would uh, decrease the uh, profit after all that it would could possibly de decrease the profit it might increase it because people might prefer to go to a safe one than an unsafe one but it's possible one could make a case that that's going to decrease the profit because they got to pay an armed guard I guess I would say this based on the numbers we're seeing I don't think an armed guard would make the business non-viable based on the rate that they will be able to charge and are almost guaranteed to be able to charge by the way the state has structured the law with the price fixing or the uh, prohibiting prices below a certain level. And uh, so I, I think overall this, you know, for entities who are entering this to do what the law was intended, which was to, on a nonprofit basis, provide a valuable service to uh, patients in Massachusetts, I don't think this should be a major deterrent. And in some cases may make this, the facility more attractive than other facilities. So, uh, sorry for getting on the soapbox, I'm done. <laughs> okay. And then we had um, that they'll be open to inspection by the fire department, police department, zoning. So that's good. Live contacts will be available 24-7. Documentation that the planning board should be copied on all documentation that occurs between the applicant and the state. That was one that we wanted to add that is there. And that was it. So what else is in your thought process? I have a, a comment on the uh, design standards. Um, looking through the ones that we've got, we've got uh, lighting, but no lighting plan required. And then we have landscape, and we have a landscape plan required. I think that it would behoove us to require a lighting plan for something like this, especially considering the hours of operation are most likely going to be before and after dark and or after dark, especially during the winter. So yeah, I think your point's well taken. In this case, I would say that I, the state law is actually very specific about lighting and, and we have a special permit process in place, so I think I believe we would be able to take address. I'm not, you know, I, I'm pretty, you know, first of all, we could probably deal with the lighting and the findings and directives. If I may. Yeah. There's, there's two design standards you need to take a look at. You need to look at uh, the, the section that's dot 416.7 design standards. And then there's also the things that are encompassed in 465. And I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest, that this is 416.7, unless this is an old book. But if you looked at design standards under section, what in this book is 415.49. Mine looks at the 414. Hmm. Someone Marion gave me. 12. Okay. May 12. May 2012. Oh, that, excuse me. I mean, the, we have had design standards, and then we have design standards. Who is the other one at? The one that I was looking at specifically mentions the commercial district. Four six five. 
Okay. I know we went to extensive the use on this one. It's the lighting. Well, I guess my comment pertains to the landscaping is, is aesthetics, whereas a lighting plan is safety. Okay, so under what they call street furniture, talks about light fixtures, shall be designed to be a number and height that grants plentiful lighting. Such lighting shall shine downward so as not to affect adjacent properties, side and street, outdoor tables. To do, you know, so we have some latitude there. Okay. okay, but a lighting plan would, would give us definitive luminaire values uh, in specific areas of the lot. I, I think we'd want to ensure that the parking lots were practically daylight. Yeah. And the state requires that, basically. Okay. And I think we can certainly cover that in our findings and directives. Yep. I think, no, I think it's point well taken. Okay, Matthew, did you have anything else? No, I think that covers uh, my comments. Thank you. Toby? Okay, this is a tough one for me. Okay. I guess in all the years that we, I've been on the planning board and we've done different zoning bylaws and stuff, uh, for me, this is the, the toughest one. Um, when I read articles in, like, the Herald uh, last week from the commissioner, Evans and his concerns about overall uh, these types of facilities in his community in Boston, understanding that's a little bit larger scale uh, with population wise, but still bringing it to a community like ours uh, brings uh, some of those same levels of concerns that he has uh, and that I have. Uh, this is one of those uh, things where uh, I believe that uh, marijuana usage for people that are suffering in pain is, an, is the appropriate thing to do and for them to have access to. But when it comes to the town of Lunenburg, this is one of the last uses I would like to see in the community because I don't think it's representative uh, of what we ultimately would want in the community. While I understand that there are some other states that are uh, recognizing uh, large rewards associated with the taxes and things they collect for, the, for this. I don't know that it specifically benefits the specific community. Uh, so, but, uh, so from an overall perspective, whether or not we had armed guards or what made this secure, to me this is one of those bylaws that uh, if we didn't have to do this and make it available, it's one thing that I would never uh, be, have any intention of bringing to the community. Because I don't think it it, it it's it reflects the values that I think that we've had here, you know, and would bring the kinds of things that we that we want in this community. So that's my personal opinion. Toby, so just a clarification: you're saying you wouldn't bring a medical facility, the medical dispensary, as it's currently defined, or, or are you talking about something I, else? I, I would not be in favor of having a grow facility here. I would not be in favor of having a dispensary here. There are dispensaries that will be in air that are close enough and, lo and local enough for the members of this community to, to get to, to be able to, to get the, their medical marijuana if they want it. To me, uh, in my opinion, it's, I just don't think it's an appropriate thing that I, want to, I would want to see in this community. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say so. While I believe in the use for people that are, that are suffering and are in pain, I just don't uh, see this as a is what I would consider a viable option for the town of Lunenburg. Just personal opinion. Yeah. Okay, and, and so with that, um, because I, I, people are gonna be that or the other. There's, there's gonna be the ones that are for it and the ones that aren't. But the state has said, you know, even if we had gotten the moratorium, the moratorium was only good till the 2014, and then we would have to create the bylaw. So. We're here at the bylaw. Is there anything you could see to add or encompass in this to make it? Um, no, I, I think that I think that what we put together here for for a bylaw and what the state is 
is that because of the nature that we have to have one, I would support the bylaw. It's just something that I wish we did, we and could have avoid. avoid. And, and I totally understand right. that. The, the one thing that I have a concern about is that uh, trying to force an armed security plan, other than being an armed security system, but putting armed guards in there, uh, you know, to to set that and and to have people of a a, a potentially criminal element that know that they're going to come prepared for that type of thing if they want to. If they want to commit a crime, they're going to do that. And I don't know that I would be in favor of having armed guards there unless it was uh, driven by a state or federal mandate. I wouldn't want to put that in the community because I think it may just bring additional trouble that we, that the unintended consequences of that. So. That's just my, again, it's just my opinion, and that's how I feel about this particular bylaw. Well, I, I thank you for your, your feedback on that. Yeah, and that's a, that, that part, I think, is pretty important. I mean, you know, I appreciate your, your educating us about your general outlook on it, and I'm sure probably we could go down here and get five different, you know, personal <laughs> opinions on I that. My there's opinions different right. of, but, well, but I think we all, but I think we all, we all meet on the same one, that we're, we're not saying that medical marijuana should not be given to people that need medical marijuana. I, I think we can all agree on that, that yep. that's throughout this board, and it's never been about, no, we don't want people that need this to not get it. Even the more, we've never had that mind thought. Ab absolutely, no, I, I mean, a absolutely. I guess the, the last part you're talking about, about the arm, arm guard, it sounds like, you know, that's, we still got some time on this one, so I, I'm not totally, you know, locked in on that either, but I feel like it's a good, I can't think of any other mechanism right now, given our situation. It, it, we have to have the discussion. Eggs, that's what I'm we trying to say. We have to have yeah. the discussion. So I think it's a valid discussion point. Yeah. And, and that's mine, is, is once I hear back, if Joel says we can, yep. then I, I'd like to hear the public comment. I'd also that. like yes. to hear from the police chief again to make sure he thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Let me have Marjorie check. With However, you want to cut the conversations that we have. I think the, the fact that a lot of this takes uh, place in front of the camera, I think it just demonstrates that we have dialogue and we look at all the possible alternatives when we're trying to put a bylaw together. So if, in my particular opinion, I, th I think it speaks to the strength of the, of the board of, of putting out uh, ideas and concepts that may not be typically thought of, but are out there at least for discussion. So I, I commend the other members of, of the board for, for doing those things. Absolutely. So. Well, it's brainstorming. It's, it's thinking outside the box. It's something new, we don't know. And, and it's trying to think of all avenues. And, and I respect everybody's input on this immensely. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're trying to grow as a board and, you know, I think there's, you know, we, we all feel like there's been other situations like with the solar thing where maybe we, if we had just thought harder about some of the consequences, we could have saved the town some pain and, you know, gotten a better initial bylaw and that would have been good for everybody. Um, the other issue is, I mean, this was an issue that was specifically brought directly to our attention by a member of our legal counsel who informed us that from their perspective, this was on their radar as an issue arising from the specific context in which these things happen. So uh, Kay Doyle, of who, for, you know, who when she spoke to us was of Coupleman and Page, and I believe Coupleman and Page would still say the same thing, that this is something as a board you, need, you want to be aware of as you're looking to you know, zone to achieve the goals we're always trying to in terms of health, public safety, you know, Absolutely. economic development, et cetera. So yeah, thanks, Joanna. Damon, is there anything else you want to add? No, I just want to kind of agree with Toby as far as the sentiments of if we didn't have to do this, I wouldn't be for it at all mm -hmm. in, in Lunenburg, the same as he said. So I'm just, I would echo Toby's mentality. And Nathan. Oh, uh, well, I guess since everybody's going on the record here, I guess, I mean, I, it's a little bit different position, I guess. I think if, I, you know, it, for good reasons, you know, s s different states are going at different speeds. I personally view, you know, marijuana use is a kind of personal, well, it's illegal. So right now it's an illegal choice. As far as if this were to go, if you were in Colorado, I'd see it as a personal choice, something akin to alcohol consumption. 
this, the rest of the country has the benefit of watching Colorado and learning from how that process goes there. Um, I personally, you know, in theory, if in the future that was legal in Massachusetts, this could be an agricultural opportunity for Lunenburg <laughs> and a, a business opportunity. That's not really what's in front of us right now. What's in front of us right now is the specific context around the specific legal framework in the state and, um, you know, and these facilities with the different constraints of federal law and the state law and the price being what it is, which gives rise to a whole different set of issues. But that, like, just like Toby and Damon says, that's my personal thing. I'm not a, a promoter. That I don't advocate that people personally should use it for non-medical reasons, <laughs> but I, I see it as a choice like, you know, like, like drinking alcohol or whatnot. So, so I just don't, I guess the reason I'm saying this is not that anyone really should care much what I think. I just want them to, th I, don't, I don't want people to feel like this is motivated, our board is motivated by, you know, a single unifying, you know, whatever, political, underlying political agenda or something. It's just, we all have different opinions on this and we're all focused on the specific needs of this RMD thing in Massachusetts, regardless of where we're at on the broader issue. Yeah, I, I guess my, my only, and this is probably my, my final point on this, is that we've always been uh, asked or taxed with to bring good business to Lunenburg. So when, when you think about it, when we, uh, got uh, Emerald Place, which I think is a, is, is a decent development. We, we got a nice CVS to come with it. My question is, is I don't know if you put one of these uh, RMD facilities in the commercial district, will it have a positive or will it have a negative effect on the growth of that commercial district and bringing good business in? If there are, if there are mitigating circumstances where there are troubles with these locations uh, and, and things like that. Does it now then negate the overall development of that additional commercial property? So when I think of planning, I, I, I have to think in the context of the overall benefit to the community by do, taking certain actions. And this one is there's just not enough data to know what the impact is, you know, and how it could ultimately impact the growth in our commercial districts by allowing these in? I don't know. I just don't know. Just, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a fantastic point. And to that point, I'm glad that we've started to put in things like we have done in the last few years in the commercial district that I think really help mitigate that. I mean, we've got stuff like this going back a long way, but things like the signage bylaw and now the new design bylaw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, limitations and you know noise and this and that i th they help i think mitigate the downside that the use of a particular establishment can have now with this one i am worried about like you say i think the safety impact yeah, in I, it I, is an issue because well, we don't know we, They're all th the we don't know this is one of the ones where we we truly don't know true but i think we're doing a good job trying to over time reduce and manage the amount of unknowns through these other measures that we're putting in place as the planning board. So I feel good about that part. Thank you. So now, on, uh, Nathan, just to clear on this, the, the bylaw itself, did you have any other? No, I think the modifications we talked about today in terms of the research and possible modification of setbacks and buffers, I think that was a great conversation. I think uh, the addition that Damon mentioned about, um, you know, adding, s separating out requirement about that the fire and police approve the final security plan was is a really good one did we i feel did we miss was there another point that you had that we didn't capture in terms of security there uh you wanted to bust that one out and was there anything else i thought there might i felt like there was a second thing that i no and I you just, wanted jimmy to check on the armed guard if he was okay with that the chief himself yeah because he may not want a third person, I guess, in the mix there that he has to deal with when he shows up on the So I do have that to check to make sure. And an armed guard can also escalate the situation too farther than it would, so I just want to make sure it's okay with him. It would be really valuable if he could join us at the public hearing, perhaps. And we yeah. can invite both of them, both the chiefs again. That would be great, mm -hmm. yeah. Because the residents may have you know, questions they want to direct, put directly to them mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So beyond that, I mean, I do have, you know, I think if, 
I think it's a little early stages as far as the arm guard stuff goes. If we start to, as we figure out more about that, I think we might have to, you know, fine tune that. But so other than that, I'm I'm good with the rest of the person. Okay. So with the with the amendments we spoke of today, Marjorie will will fix those, and then we will send this off to legal tomorrow, and try to get a response back from them as quickly as possible. So we'll be ready for the public hearing on the 24th. Does that work for everybody? Yes. I just want to double check one last thing. Yeah, all right, that's great. So that's good. Thank you for getting through that process. I know it's been agonizing, but it'll be worth it at the end. Warrant for the public hearing. You see, Lundberg, that's all set, ready to go. It's already been advertised. White Tails Crossing. Now, what, what happened with White Tails Crossing is uh, Danny Proctor wants to get on this town warrant for the road and get the road approved by um, the town of Lunenburg. So, the issue is the snow. And our peer review engineer and Jack Rodequins, the highway can't go and check all the requirements they need to to make sure it's acceptable but you got to get on the warrant by a date that the snow's still here so what we've done is we recommended that he get a plate we had Danny put a place card holder on the warrant because worst case if it doesn't get on the warrant we could just pass over at a town meeting but we didn't want him to miss his opportunity to not be on the warrant so and we're working with uh, Jesse and Jack to as the snow melts be able to go jesse did a preliminary and everything looks good but he has to look at the gravel the the grade and all of that which he can't do while all the snow is here so that was the issue with white tails crossing and that's what we've done for that as of yet so do we want to so uh, marjorie sent a memo around and i i mistakenly thought the memo was like from last meeting and i'm like what we didn't talk about it. we didn't do this um <laughs> Do we want to take some kind of motion? I, I'd have to reread the memo, but um, it's, is it like conditionally approving it based on, you know, positive recommendation from our reviewing engineer? Uh, no, because um, all we have to do is once the peer review goes out and Jack goes out, they'll both say yes, you know, everything looks good, it's okay to approve, or Jack or Jesse will say no, Danny still has to, or, you know, the developer has to fix A, B, and C before it can do that okay. so until we get that back from them got it that's when we would vote on the recommendation that okay. the road is it is ready and acceptable to be become a town road so the memo is not going out this memo is going out to um, just letting them know what we're doing okay yeah oh no she is asking me recommended acceptance stream Right. That it's the planning board's understanding that Mr. Proctor will be seeking application for approval. Therefore, the planning board is conditionally approving the plan to facilitate Mr. Proctor putting a place card holder. That's what we're facilitating is that he uh, can okay. put a place card holder on that. Okay, so do we want to, so this looks good. Um, if, uh, do you want to send it around to the, maybe they've already read it. Yes. Yeah. But uh, do we want a motion to, to put the place card holder on. Put the place card holder right. and support the intent of the memo yeah, here. We can do that just for the record if you'd like, sure. Yeah, because it does say that we conditionally recommended yeah. it. So uh, I'll make, I just while you guys are reading that, we can have discussion afterwards. I'm going to make the motion to approve the memo as put together there, which is to go to um, 
the Board of Selectmen and uh, talk about how we're supportive of that place card going on the warrant and will can you know conditional upon you know review that it's appropriate by Jesse and Jack um, that we would we if those conditions are met we'd approve we'd recommend approval of accepting the roadways for maintenance by the town thank you and we have a second second all in favor Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. There was something too that I, um, Elmwood, I wanted to, I probably could have brought up when I was, um, on Elmwood, but I did not. Mike Savageo Okay. Mike Savageo, the building zoning officer, sent a letter to Anthony Cleves Whitnam and Bingham Engineers, 510 Mechanic Street, Lemonster, Mass. 01453 regarding Elmwood subdivision. Dear Anthony, at your request, I have reviewed the general bylaw of the town of Lunenburg and have found that the approved subdivision for Michael Crawley signed by the planning board and dated February 24th, 2014 is exempt from requirements of an earth removal permit under Article 9, Section 9, Number 12 of the general bylaw. If you have any questions in regard to this correspondence, please feel free to contact me respectfully Michael Savageo. so what they're saying is based on article 9 section 9 number 12 and Matthew's getting his book out so he could read that my only goes up to eight is that, that's, that's, <laughs> book, right? is that the general town bylaw yes the general bylaw so general it, town bylaw yeah it wouldn't be here. it's okay that's the rules and regs uh, I have the protective. this is a protective bylaw. Oh, okay yeah. it's not the general town's bylaws okay but so that Anthony must have read that question, Mike, Mike checked it. And so because of the subdivision, they do not have to get the, or because it's in the subdivision, they don't have to get it. So that was clarified by Mike Savageo. And I wanted everybody to So know can that. I just reiterate the, the impact on the town from that was, what was that? The, the 10 yard trucks every two minutes for two oh, months? Good love Marjorie, she gave it to me right here. Exemptions. This ordinance shall be constructed to apply to any such removal incident to the construction or altercation of any structure for which a building permit has been issued or to the removal incident to the installation of any cesspool or septic tank for which a permit has been issued by the Board of Health or the grading or development of any approved subdivision or public way. So does that read if we approve a subdivision then it doesn't have to go through the basically it yeah. basically sounds like it's applied like i got my yard and i just start removing i got my land and i just start removing a ton of gravel that's when it applies that's what it looks like here so it would only actually apply to someone who is only looking to sell gravel and not build something there yeah that's another way of that's putting a pretty it. weak bylaw <laughs> yeah but that's what <laughs> it's a targeted bylaw. <laughs> How is that headed? What is the name the name of that section? Exemptions number twelve. Exemptions. But was it was it a gravel removal or was it an earth removal or was it a removal? I think that that sounds like that's more in tune with the uh, removal of overburden in, in a residential subdivision right, more, for the more than being explicit to uh, something that's being. Uh, mined for gravel or what have you so i don't know what the overall intent is of what they're planning on removing from that site i don't know if it's uh, a gravel field that they've uh, well they're regrading a significant portion of the site to make it work yeah. Yeah. how significant uh, pretty significant pretty, yeah. pretty significant. significant so is it really a, a gravel permit or is it really the removal of overburden it's not necessarily oh it's 10 foot cuts it's not overburden it's so it's, 
I guess I have a question on whether or not that still shouldn't be reviewed. Well, do you want, um, because Mr. Savageau told, um, it didn't come through us. Mr. Savageau, um, Anthony requested this from Mr. Savageau, and Mr. Savageau, the zoning officer, responded to him and gave a copy to the planning board. So do we want to have Mr. Savageau come to the meeting and talk to us about this? We can ask him, invite him to our meeting. Can I just see the way it's written? Okay. And what all is this? So what is this? What is the net effect? This is waiving their need to uh, yeah, when notify we, the town of a schedule for their trucks? Or what exactly is Well, they need to go in front. Uh, if my understanding is correct, Mrs. Bertram come, came at the meeting and stated that they would need to get an earth removal permit, this, which we weren't aware of. And Paula had pointed that out. I, I got to tell you, I'm very concerned about that decision because yeah, the question I, it, that I asked at the planning board meeting was, was this going to be for commercial resale? And the answer was yes. My concern is we had a situation where an individual came forward, they were building one home, and because of the volume of material that they were removing, Mr. Savage required they get an earth removal permit. So I'm a little bit concerned as to why this decision is different. And I'm very concerned, as Mr. Allison said, about the volume of trucks that you're talking about and the significant topography changes that are going to, that are going to be required. We're talking about, I believe, I thought it was 50,000 cubic yards or something of, of material from this piece of property. So I, as a member of the Board of Selectmen, I'm going to recommend tomorrow night that we follow up with Mr. Savageau and have him in because I'm very concerned about that decision. Yeah. And, and we just got the letter. Like I said, we got a copy yeah. of the, the, yeah. the, the letter he sent to... You know, as was pointed out by Mr. Allison at a previous meeting, the number of trips that we're talking about on, in a residential area are astronomical. Um, and, and the amount of material being removed, I, you know, typically an earth removal permit would require the plan before, the plan after, um, and, and restrictions can be placed as to the operation. And I think it is something that would require an earth removal permit. So I do, now, you know, I, I heard you just read the bylaw, and certainly it does exempt subdivisions. But because of the volume of material and because it is not, it's not incidental to develop development, it is an operation in and of, in and of itself. So I do intend to follow up on it. Yeah, and, and we, can, we can, as I said, ask if Mr. Savage can come to the 24th meeting to talk well, to us about it. While I'm concerned about the outcome, I, reading the bylaw, I can't really question Mr. Savage's ruling because it's pretty clear in the bylaw as to what he's saying. So I. I'm not happy about the outcome either, but I can't really argue with his ruling. And a, a subdivision to take a look at to see what we did with was when they did Houghton's Mill okay. back in the day. I know there were, there, that was a gravel field and I know there was tremendous amounts of gravel taken out of there. So I would go and, and right. see whether or not they, they fell under the, the requirement of okay. having a, a Okay, gravel I will, and, I, and I'm curious as to why the, the building of the home on Flat Hill Road, perhaps because he didn't obtain the building permits prior to the removal, and maybe that's the issue, is maybe, you know, that's the question that I have, is typically if you, you have a certain amount of time to execute that building permit, and I think it's six months, so I don't know whether they're planning on getting the building permits and doing this operation that quickly, or, because what I think I heard you just say, and I, and I want to look at it myself, is that if it's part of the issuance of a building, the, permit or a city, but, but then again, it says subdivision. So, you know, I, I really want to look at it, and I thank you for the advice on looking at Holton's Mill. I definitely so, will do that. I think moving forward, we would either want to readdress that bylaw or spend more time during our approval process looking at earth removal because we kind of started touching on it, and then we said, oh, no, the select we have to look at it anyway. So we didn't spend that much time on it, whereas clearly it's an issue in this project. Hmm. I, agree. I, I think there's got to be some clearer definitions as to what overburden is and what, you know, <clears throat> defines overburden and what, you know, if there is any specificity to that as to, uh, you know, what the range is for overburden versus uh, earth removal. So I'm on board with what you guys are saying. Right now, the bylaw in question isn't within the planning board's purview, if I understand. Now, we could address this perhaps in our regulations, but maybe we, if, if we're serious about planning this, we need to maybe coordinate a strategy with, I mean, is this under Board of Selectmen's purview, these regulations, or who? Well, I, I, I do, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, go ahead. See if uh, there's anything in the 
finding in directors for the Houghton's Mill project way back in the day as to whether or not there was any requirement for an earth removal permit for that. I don't know if there was or there wasn't, but you know, let's see if there was any other uh, information relative to that project. At that well, point. and, and it, you know, for me reading, it talked about um, septic, you know, because they're taking the gravel out for septic systems, but we know they're doing a lot more than that with the, the gravel they're taking out. Uh, so where they kept, we waived four or five things for them because they kept saying we're only eight houses, so we're really not a subdivision. We're a small subdivision. So they asked for all those waivers. So, you know, maybe in the directives we can put that we still want you to get because so much gravel is going out yeah. that we, we would like you to get a, a earth removal. Yeah, they had no problem asking us for the five waivers that we waived, and we, you know. Again, this is one of those this tough ones is to relative to who has ownership for that piece, you know. Is that really uh, uh, the building official enforcement officer's the ultimate decision? And it, and it very well may be, but I think we have a responsibility to look at past subdivisions that we did. Okay. And that I'll were pull the finding directors of, of civil, civil, civil uh, similar nature so yeah I will have her pull that I would I would like to suggest a, th a third one to look at in in recent past is about 10 years ago was the subdivision on Flat Hill uh, it's in very close proximity to the question the one in question uh, very similar soil materials I don't know what they had for removal there but which yeah. one was that yeah. flat yeah. flat yeah, yeah. Cortland yeah. circle yeah, flat flat hill wasn't an extensive. No, it was, it was pretty one. flat. I, I know, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Houghton, Houghton's Mill was because I know there was a uh, bunch of gravel being removed from there. Seeing I built the home in there. Okay. Meeting schedule. Our next meeting is going to be a public hearing for our medical one. By law, that's March 24th, 6.30 here at Town Hall. Then we will have a meeting April 14th and a meeting April 20th. Town Caucus, don't forget, is Monday, March 17th. So make sure you're there. Do we have any board comments? I'm all talked out. Okay, do we have any public <laughs> comments? Oh, come on up. I just want to comment that you guys the public hearing is the 24th and at the board of selectmen meetings we've talked about having a workshop with you guys to talk about a number of issues um, including the, the proposed bylaw but pri and we'd like to have that prior to the public hearing we'd also like to talk about in a, and I don't know if any of you have heard I, I'm concerned with some of the, the drainage projects and the, and the cost to the town for these projects um, on the subdivisions and, and as you guys all know the dollars are dwindling and especially with a new school it's going to be tighter and tighter and my concern is the, the cost of a, an already overboard burden DBW um, so we had talked about that last Tuesday and I think it's just something even if we can just Dave Matthews made a suggestion maybe we can have some sort of standardized you know, storm drainage system so that we have the equipment we need to maintain it. Or, but I think it's important that the DPW, the planning board, and the and the board of selectmen get together and talk about this. Um, I think that, you know, to prevent what happened at the last town meeting, having a workshop to talk about the bylaw. So I, I don't know if the town manager's been in touch with you yet, but it's No, I, I've emailed her okay, asking her, because we can meet at a workshop six to seven before your selectmen meeting. Okay. Um, or if she, I didn't know if it would be longer and you would want us the Tuesday of the last of the month where the sewers here okay. and, and meet with you that evening. So I, I emailed Carrie last week on that and I, okay. I don't know if she's going to check with all of all you right. tomorrow I, night. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I'll bring it up tomorrow, yeah. but I think it's important that we schedule that pretty quick. So. But whatever, whatever works for you guys, if, if you want us to come at 5 36 o'clock before your regular Tuesday or take that last Tuesday. You just let us know, and I'll let my board know as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sweet. Thanks. I actually did have some comment. Yeah, I'm coming to the board. I do public in the board. Board comment? Oh. I thought you'd ask about that first. Um, anyways, uh, I was just following up. Uh, Nathan had suggested that it would be interesting to see about the site distances, what the increases mm -hmm. in referring to the force court. Um, I went and I, I researched that. I printed up the material. 
um, the 280, the 280 feet required for a 25 mile an hour design speed is for a passenger car pulling out of the driveway and making a left turn for a passenger car. Now, the, the entrance that we were talking about was not for passenger cars. It was for commercial vehicles, trucks, tractors, trailers. Um, the stopping sight distance required was 155 feet for the person coming at 25 miles an hour towards them. Now, when you go up to 30 miles an hour design speed, the, the sight distance that was 280 feet goes up to 335 feet. And the required stopping distance is 200 feet for the vehicle approaching at 30 miles an hour. And when you get up to 35 miles an hour speed, the sight distance required is 390, 110 more than they were under by 35 feet. Um, and the stopping sight distance to stop Traveling at 35 miles an hour is 250 feet. Now, they said that they had 235 feet. So if there was a vehicle traveling at 35 miles an hour that came around the corner at the precise time that one of these tractor trailers decided to pull out, they're saying, this, now this is from AASHTO, American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials. And what our review engineer had quoted as a suggested minimum is actually required safe distance, as reported by AASHTO. Uh, I did not bring these up. These, were, these are common knowledge for me. I did not bring them up because of the peer review's comment that they were just suggested minimums. They're not. This, this documentation uh, enforces that. Um, and, and as I was saying, if you're traveling at 35 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour over the posted, the other thing is the, the nearest posted limit to that site is three miles in Shirley it says 25 and then the next the next one on the other side is one mile away it's in Lemonster and it says 35 neither one of them are in the town of Lunenburg so regardless I mean the the distance that's on the plan is for a passenger vehicle which is inappropriate because the private exit for contractor vehicles commercial vehicles uh, and and the, the sight distance is, is, is just barely adequate for a person to come to a complete stop without hitting the vehicle that's pulling out. Um, so that was just a follow-up on that information. Um, and then you're welcome to look at it if you'd like. Uh, I, I print, printed up the definitions. Thank you. Okay, any other board comments? Well, yeah, so I, actually it, I had the sa same topic he had. I just want to follow up on the the signage we talked about maybe uh, getting something into Jack about that so thanks for bringing that up I mean sight distance is pretty serious and then stopping distance is basically what for a typical vehicle the distance it requires to come to a full stop so that's that's pretty serious stuff like it means yes even if you see it and you want to stop and the thing's pulling out you can't stop so that's kind of bad news um, so I, I think that kind of underscores the importance of us having the conversation with Jack I, I'm sure he so the last thing he needs is another issue to deal with, but um, in starting the conversation with the Mass DOT just to, to see uh, so that we can get some some good signage posted there. And I mean, the the numbers Matt's talking about. I mean, I you know for what it's I, I would uh, under just say I agree with him about the seriousness of this is a safety issue, and you know it, it might merit. A 25 mile an hour speed limit sign with flashing yellow lights <laughs> honestly like like it's that serious in some description of why you know tr you know maybe a description explaining to drivers why it's 25 like you know whatever trucks whatever I don't know what the, I'm sure the DOT has suggested signage for this type of situation uh, but yeah we really just like you know it, it, it's it, once this traffic really starts to get active there the, they don't just make those numbers up. Those are the traffic highway safety, the national organization, and it's going to be not only depressing, I don't know, we'll all feel awful if something happens, if we could have done something and we didn't. So, yeah, I would, um, could we put like an action item on Marjorie's plate or is there somehow do we make this happen with Jack? Yeah, we can ask Marjorie to see if Jack can have some kind of signage posted there with the speed limit that'd be great that would that would be great if, if, 
if I recall, we asked to to do the same thing before we uh, approved that force corp. Yes, we did. Yeah. Okay. We did. Um, and and another thing to talk about, Jack, with would be uh, our, our regulation or our our um, uh, the waivers that we allow uh, to be granted to some of these smaller subdivisions for roads that later become public. Uh, it's very common for the boundary markers, the bound, the, the, the permanent boundaries to be uh, omitted or waived. Uh, those, those, are, those are very important for the towns, people, the laborers when they're working. If they need to expand or they need to do something within the right of way, they need to be able to readily identify where the divi divider is between public and private property. And likewise with, with personal private property owners, to, to, to be able to see, well, this is, this is the line here, this is my property and this is the town's property. And when, you've, when you buy a piece of land, you get a piece of paper that's got plan, that's got lines on it, but uh, when you go physically to the property, it's, it's not the same as looking down at a piece of paper, and it's very easy to misjudge some distances. And, and I mean, it's just blatantly obvious where town property is versus private property if these permanent boundaries are in place. Um, and I would like to get Jack's input on that as well. Are you talking about the drainage maintenance uh, easement? Well, specifically the, uh, the Whitetail Crossing, because they were waived on that project. White white tail crossing. What was you t white tail crossing? What well, was that's we coming up? That was the one we just su suggested to the selectman. The re recommendation to select board for street acceptance. Okay, which boundaries uh, are you talking about? Just so I understand. Well, the um, the requirement for permanent boundary markings is is at property lines intersecting the roadway. Where where the prop where private property abuts public property along a road okay basically so if you've got a look like let's let's use Elmwood for an example um, they did not ask for the waiver I don't know if it's required it's not required for less than 10 lots um, so you mean like something indicating like at the end of a driveway that the boundary markers the uh, frontage boundary markers along the public way okay that, that demarcate yeah. the beginning of the public way or yeah their their property boundary versus the public way okay I got gotcha. you I got gotcha. you okay and I'm not entirely sure that it's that it's an, it's an even in, an important issue to, to to the DPW but I would like to to ask them if it is and to take that into consideration when we're when we're looking at granting these waivers for things that that we apparently don't know all that much about well, I, yeah, I mean, I think I would imagine that like we consulted with uh, DPW on this, uh, for example, this Elmwood subdivision about the drainage, I would imagine they were consulted about, I mean, it's pretty typical practice to consult. Well, yes, and, about I, and I would, I, I didn't want to cut anybody off, but um, I'm, I would hope that we pay, the, well, the developer pays for a peer engineer that is on the, the town side that goes and make sure all that happens. And, and for example, as I said, with Whitetail Crossing, Jack is going to meet with our peer review engineer, Jesse Johnson, as soon as the snow has melted to make sure everything is supposed to be done, that our, our bylaws say should be done with that before we accept that road. But the stuff you're talking about, Matt, is stuff that happened when the subdivision was approved. They were waived. Right. Then. Part, of, part of the plan, and I wasn't here at the time, but the, the, the applicant requested that we waive, that the board waive the requirement for boundary markers. For White Tail Crossing? White Tail Crossing. Okay, I, I couldn't say yes well, or no that, to that. And I'm not positive as many projects as we come across and as many issues as I've had with all of them um, that that was the specific one, but I know for a fact that it was one up and coming for a public acceptance of a roadway, and I'm pretty sure it was that. I can certainly look through my notes. Okay. But yeah, I can't. I can't answer that. I can't <laughs> say if we waived it or not which off is the fine. top of my head. Which is fine. I the 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 issue that I'm trying to address here is that the common commonplace of of waiving certain requirements that are in the bylaw, and we we seem to at this point simply waive them because we typically waive them, and that that's that's how the 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 engineers the applicants come to us. They ask us, well, we, we're gonna we're, we're gonna ask you to waive this one, this one, this one because because it's less than 10 lots and because it's commonly asked for and because you guys always give it, that's not a 
good reason. I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I'd like to think we take the waivers pretty seriously, you know. Um, and I think, yeah, but I do think there are mitigating factors with, with lot size and the nature of the project. But I hear what you're saying. I think we do. We can't give any waiver without careful consideration. I'm totally on board with you on that. If you're saying we should not waive anything. You no, know, that's not at all. Okay. No, I, no, I think, is that what you're saying? It's basically give careful consideration to these? I think, I think, right. I, yeah. There should be an understanding of, first of all, wh why was it in the bylaw as a requirement mm -hmm. if it's always waived or regularly waived or if it's a common place to ask for the waiver? I think one thing you'll find is in terms of bylaws and what we can do is, in general, if you're writing a bylaw, <laughs> you'd rather, if it's not in there, if even if you're going to waive it 80 percent of the time if it's important to enforce 20 percent of the time you better have it in the bylaw because otherwise you got nothing <laughs> so that might be that's probably part of the process <laughs> well and, and i i think I've, i just want to piggyback on that because i think waivers that come in front of us we do take very seriously and i'll take elmwood two of them for three meetings we said no we weren't going to answer that till we heard from conservation and we asked conservation to come to our meeting and specifically give their recommendation on us waiving that so it's not that we just oh yeah sure we we spent three weeks talking on those five waivers and two of them like i said took three meetings and two visits from conservation before we waived them so i i think we we look at them well in my in my in my in my opinion, what you just said was that we were hanging our hat on approving that on what conservation had to say about one of our bylaws. No, it was about things that were due to the wetlands that were impacting the, that, the plan that we would approve. Well, the maximum length of 650 feet for a dead end road has nothing to do with conservation, the requirement of it. Okay. Well, it did because we were looking. In that instance, it did. Right. Yes. And we were looking for that the the conservation trail in yeah. the back right oh, well, that I that was the trail i was looking at the impacts on the wetlands not the trail the trail already there was already a trail it wasn't on his property but okay anything else yeah i move we adjourn well we got to see if anybody else has comments nathan Damon. I second the agenda. Uh, I just add one real quick thing, guys. It won't take long, I don't think. Uh, it might have already gotten to this force corp we talked about. And it's not important. This is just a journey. I can take We can talk well, about no, it. Well, no, I want you to be able to uh, express just your any, comments. Are we, um, I was just curious, any update on the social media policy from Carrie or board? Not as of yet. Not as of yet? Okay. Not as of yet. But when we have our workshop, we can check with her on that, too. Fantastic. Thank remember you. that. I, will, I, will keep, I can't guarantee I'll remember it all, so you remember <laughs> the social network. Okay, anything else? Sorry. Nathan? Uh, no, thank okay. you very much. I am, um, I just want to quickly, I did have to keep you in the loop. I did have a meeting today with uh, Carrie and Marjorie with the MRPC, and we have someone, Marion is still out. Um, so we have someone that's going to come um, from MRPC. She'll come work in the office probably four hours, two days a week, and then she'll be here for the planning board meetings. You've met her, and I, I apologize. I think it was Shana, the girl that came with the village bylaw and was talking to us with the, the village bylaw that works over in MRPC. So she's going to be kind of our liaison helping us until uh, Marion gets back. And um, Thursday, this Thursday, uh, we're going in front of, I'm going in front of the finance committee to do our budget. And I'm asking them for um, kind of more of a um, director of land use versus a planning director that will kind of oversee uh, planning conservation board of health that will be able to have weekly monthly meetings with all the groups so everybody's talking conservation board of health planning board they they all know where the plan is who's got what who's waiting for what and kind of facilitate um both um administratively as well as 
making sure everybody's working together for that that plan and everybody's talking to everybody so we all know what conservation is doing so that's something that we put in the budget um, for this this year that I'm going to um, talk to finance about on Thursday so those are a couple of things that I've been working on with with Kerry to, to have done follow-up question yes. um, what um what uh, what other positions in town are um, assigned to the planning director position, like like capital planning chair? That's de facto, right? Those I mean, are her committees. Yeah, okay, she has so, committees she's under. So what are they? That's capital uh, planning. I can't I can't tell you all of them off my head. What she's on? I know she's on t uh, capital planning, she, the green she, task force. She's the chair of capital planning, right? Um, As the planning director. I don't know if she is the chair. She, I think Ernie Sum was the chair last year. Um, I don't know who became the chair this year, Matthew. Okay. Okay. I, I don't think it was Marion. I, I do not think Marion is the chair of that committee. Okay. And I know last year it was Ernie Sun. And then the Green Community Task Force. Again, she is not the chairperson. She was like a liaison to that. And, and I, I don't know if there's other committee. I know she used to go to meet open space technical advisory committee with her and jack right Te technical advisory the, committee. The, the tech review meetings is that what you're i've only got the 2012 town report to go by is the only thing i can find and the 2012 town report specifies her as the chair of capital planning and one of two people on the technical advisory committee and the green community yeah the green communities i know she's uh, on open space i wasn't aware of um the 40s officer right for the uh, tritown the uh, yeah she was so there's five things um i'm sure there's more right i would think so but but what's the question well I, I, it's not just the planning director and and you're 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 just suggesting expanding it and i and i don't disagree with the idea of expanding i think it's a good idea to expand it um, to include uh, an overview of the land boards, it sounds mm -hmm. like a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, much needed, I think, to kind of tie them all together. Exactly. Very good. I was just curious on those different aspects, and I thought that they deserve mention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That is all I had. So, Toby, I would now, we have to go into an executive session. <laughs> so, with that, Okay, I'll make a motion that we come out of our regular session to go into executive session and not to return. Second. And we will be going into executive session in accordance with MGL C30A number 21A3 to discuss strategy to respect the litigation of O'Brien Holmes versus Town of Lunenburg if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. Sure. The man that was here in the very beginning, uh, Jamie. Jamie Rowe. Because that piece was his first published piano concerto, it took the number one in the catalog.